behavioral issues in children, right? Um, hopefully it was a little bit uh, helpful for you. And um, um, I hope you started noticing like if there are any children around you um, that you see like some abnormal behaviors or symptoms, then um, I hope that you started to uh, notice. Um, we sometimes uh, tend to overdiagnose or like uh, misunderstand certain um, certain behaviors or certain uh, manifestations as uh, uh, all abnormal behaviors. Like once we start focusing and really, um, really uh, engaging with the materials that talk about abnormality, we tend to kind of categorize people according to uh, like what we know, like the the frames that we have, and we tend to put them into the boxes that we have in our minds. And sometimes it can be dangerous because um, it's not clear cut. Um, you know, certain abnormality is very apparent and obvious, but um, other times we don't want to misdiagnose based on like very short encounters with that person. Right? If we don't know that uh, person or if we don't know the culture, um, Things like that. Um, for example, eye contact. You know, in Asian cultures in general, you are not supposed to look straight into the other person's eyes, um, and which is greatly encouraged in the Western culture. And um, just because a person does not look into your eyes all the time, does not mean that this person is abnormal or has like autistic symptoms or uh, some other psychological issues. And so we want to actually take into consideration all the factors, uh, just the manifestation itself, but the self-report and also um, the cultural factors and uh, unless you have like thoroughly examined all factors that like, you don't want to come to a haste conclusion um, is something that we want to watch out for. Yeah, having said that, um, we want to start with a prayer uh, just like we always do and uh, we want to actually, because we finished uh, the uh, Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5, we want to uh, actually meditate on uh, the book of James, um, which is going to be very helpful for you and me. Yeah, so let's lift, lift up our prayers to God, uh, meditate on the Word of God, and then we're going to talk about socialization today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy that abound. Lord, you are good and true, and you're loving, and we want to learn from your examples. You're slow to anger, abounding in love. You've been so patient with us and you will be patient. But Lord God, we don't want to take advantage of the fact that you are patient and long waiting, long persevering, because ultimately what we want to do is to please you, to make you happy as our loving dad, the, the, the one who created us with love and with uh, joyful anticipation that we will actually um, love you back the way you loved us and that we would truly reflect your loving relationship within your trinity in our relationship with each other and our relationship with you. And Father God, so allow us, empower us, admonish us and transform us so that we can actually um, become like you because we're created in your own image and you want us to imitate you because that's the best that can happen to us and through us. And you want us to represent you on this earth and we want to do it faithfully. Father God, it's so, um, we, we, we feel sometimes not capable of loving other people when they're not lovable, when they don't behave lovingly towards us. Father God, we have difficulty forgiving others when they have done great damages repeatedly. And Father, um, we are fleshly in our own nature. And so have mercy on us. Pour upon us your love. Help us experience your love even at a deeper level today so that we may be able to reflect your love and we may be able to be a channel of blessings for other people um, that originate from you. Father, we give you thanks in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, so, Book of James. Uh, Book of James is kind of short, but it's, uh, it's really interesting. And it's really uh, convicting and transforming. And so we want to talk about it. 
Um, we're going to start with uh, James chapter 1, and uh, I have the uh, screen ready for you, and I will read for you. Um, you can look at the screen and follow along. Um, I hope that it is um, visible to you. Okay, yeah. Book of James, uh, chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Trials and temptations, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Yes, so um, this is a good break. And so we're going to talk about um, chapter 1, 2 to 8 today. Yeah, it's kind of loaded. So, um, James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Okay, so it's significant that um, uh, James called the recipients of this uh, uh, letter, um, or whoever is going to read this, the audience, brothers and sisters. Um, for those of you who have been exposed to Christianity, uh, you're probably familiar with these terms. Brothers and sisters mean that we are, uh, originally mean that we are biologically related to each other, that uh, we, um, yeah, we are, we have the same parents, that um, um, we're very close. So brothers and sisters mean that we're closer even um, than like our friends or um, anybody who is important in our lives. Um, but I'm sure that um, that is not the case for some of you who have come from certain background, um, certain families don't necessarily have close family relationships. And uh, um, I understand what you mean if you say that because um, I grew up in that kind of environment that was not very healthy, that was not, um, not the best environment for a child to grow up um, in. And so, um, for whatever the reason is, um, it could be cold parents, emotionally cold parents, it could be um, parents' conflicts, parental conflicts, um, divorce, uh, separation, or um, death of one of the spouses and you know, you are raised by a single mother or father and they were so thin and stretched, and there was nobody else to uh, help you raise, help help your parents raise you, and therefore they could not give you the enough uh, the attention that you needed as a child. Or it could be just a very dysfunctional family where um, there is um, divisiveness, you know, um, talking behind the back, you know, uh, or um, uh, manipulative, uh, violent or uh, at least not very encouraging, like it could be a very negative, um, gloomy, uh, pessimistic um, atmosphere pervasively. Um, but these are all, all really um, not helpful in terms of you growing up as a healthy child, right? Emotionally healthy child. Um, so sometimes when you hear the word brothers and sisters, and um, especially from somebody who, who are not biologically related to us, 
then we're like, really? You call me a brother and sister. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure why I'm uh, talking about this part because that's not the central part of the passage today, but uh, maybe the Holy Spirit wants uh, some of us to, to he, he wants to minister to some of us. Yeah, so let, let me just continue to talk about it. So then, um, you know, when we hear that word, um, sometimes we have reactions. Like some people, like I've seen some people having reactions. Really, brothers and sisters, like, are you serious? Okay, so if I go to church, um, so it, I'm talking about it before COVID-19, right? And uh, when we go to church, certain churches that I uh, visited, and I'm not trying to point fingers at them, um, because we are all responsible and we um, all have the possibility of um, you know doing the same thing and so um, I'm not saying that they done this and I don't do it we don't do it and things like that so sometimes you know um, in, in, in classes that I've taught in the past not this class and um, ever since COVID-19 and online classes like I can't say that uh, about my classes because I don't have you here physically. But when we, uh, when I had students physically in a classroom, um, I, uh, one of the things that I always did, um, although it might have been a little bit like uncomfortable for some of you, yeah, I understand that feeling because um, like even at this uh, age and I graduated from school and everything, like if we take turns like, um, introducing ourselves, like I sometimes become nervous. Yeah, um, some people enjoy it and other people are like, oh, you know what, um, I don't know, it's nerve wracking or maybe it's a mixture of both. Yeah, so I understand, but I uh, tend to kind of uh, give an opportunity for everyone. Like I start with myself, um, I start talking about uh, who I am, uh, what my interests are, what my background is, um, you know, my, my, my future dreams and, uh, um, well, well, what I'm doing uh, as part of my jobs and things like that. And um, um, I reveal a little bit about myself and then I give you opportunities to talk about yourself as well, um, about who you are and what you're like. Um, the reason is because although it may be a little bit uh, of a stretch for some of you, It's an opportunity for people to actually get to know each other a little bit because uh, we can easily come and go. We can come to this class and um, or go anywhere, right, uh, as a group. And um, you're just uh, taking in the information that you need to take in. Uh, you ask. You might even ask your, you know, uh, the person who is sitting next to you like certain questions, and they can help you with answers. And uh, we can we can be all informational. We can try to take the opportunity to get something out of the other person. But um, I mean, which can be beneficial for all of us. But um, we're all human beings. We we are going to talk about socialization today, and in, in light of the fact that we are created to socialize, we are created to know others and to be known and to. Um, to enjoy uh, a life in a um, group context. Like a, we're given a family, okay? When, when we were born on this earth, um, yes, there are orphans or there are those who grew up like orphans because of the family circumstances. Yeah, I've heard of some of the children who are um, actually uh, placed in uh, sort of like a group home for little little children because they all apparently have parents but they actually abandon them so um, things like that happen and um, or you might have parents and I'm not saying you I'm not I'm just saying you in general like to refer to anybody might have parents, um, but then they're very neg neglectful and they're emotionally absent and things like that. Then um, practically, you're like an orphan, right? Because um, as a little child, your needs were not met. So then, um, 
for whatever the reason is and whatever the circumstances are, um, there are people who have not experienced the adequate care, care, adequate care from their parents, which make them feel like orphans, right? So in that case, you know, it's an exception. But still, um, in whatever the circumstances we were born, um, we are we experience um, some kind of interactions with other human beings than ourselves. Is that true? And so, um, why is that so? And uh, why are there so many people who are connecting with um, other people through social media and other means? Yeah, why is that? Why, why do you have so many followers? I mean, you know, sometimes it's for enjoyment, and it's for entertainment. I mean, you want to have a celebrity um, among your friends, you know, on Facebook, or, you know, you follow certain um, famous people on Twitter, and that is part of your, um, it's like, how many um, followers do you have? How many friends do you have? That is almost like a status symbol these days, right? Um, so that's part of it, but then uh, more, more so than that, um, more, there, there's more to it than just that, right? Um, as much as there are, there's enjoyment and some other factors, people want to be connected. People want to uh, show other people who they are. Um, and sometimes it's really sad that you have such a high need, that some people have a very high need to uh, really um, talk about themselves online because they are not able to fully um, show themselves in person or um, they don't have the opportunities uh, well aside from COVID-19. COVID-19 really isolates people right but um, even before COVID people um, sometimes don't have anybody who sit there and listen so what I found out as uh, in my therapy room and uh, in my interactions with other people as a pastor um, is that they want to be heard and um, they want somebody to sit and hear and um, I've met some uh, brothers and sisters on the street like I call them brothers and sisters not because I have so much like love for them but because um, indeed we are children of God um, God regardless of their religious background um, because God created all of us and God is actually a good father. If he's the father of us, then we are actually siblings. And there's a good reason to call each other brothers and sisters. So um, our brothers and sisters uh, without a home, uh, experiencing homelessness, you know, I've met several of them. And uh, I remember uh, this couple, um, I actually met the couple first and then later on, I was able to talk a little more with the wife, uh, but this couple actually looked uh, like really uh, good-hearted people, but they were in dire need, and I could see that from their uh, by looking at their eyes. And uh, the couple were just underneath the tree, um, yeah, in front of the gym, and um, I was just uh, intrigued. I was just curious. Um, why they were out there and uh, of course I knew instantaneously that they were without a home and um, they had this like little um, sign that said you know without without a home uh, please help and so I just went there um, I was on my way to something uh, my appointment and so like I was kind of in a hurry but I, I, I just happened to stop and I was like okay you know what um, I'll just give, and I, and I didn't even have like proper things to share with them. Like I didn't have any bottled water. I didn't have um, even paper money. Like I had only coins, and um, so I was so totally not prepared to help. But I just went, and um, I, I found an envelope out of all things uh, in my bag, and so I put the coins in the envelope, and I said, I, I apologize. I don't have any uh, paper money. But, um, and I'm not supposed to like, you know, I don't feel good about like giving coins, but then, and this is not even a whole lot, like I, I don't know, like, um, but I, 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 I am a believer of God. I pray that 
God will utilize this money to help you. And um, I don't know what you are going through, but uh, yeah. So yeah, what, what happened? And I just happened to say that one word, you know, what happened? And the couple actually um, briefly explained their situation and what kind of needs that they have. And so, uh, so apparently they, they lost jobs. They used to have jobs. Um, so they're not like habitual, like uh, lifestyle uh, homeless people, you know, because uh, there are those people who are out there who would rather choose to be homeless because, um, so for example, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, generalize too much, but I've met several people who actually said that I'd rather be on the street uh, because this is more comfortable for me. And I'm used to it. I'm afraid to actually go back into uh, uh, an apartment or a place, um, a facility or, and things like that. And, and I'm afraid to actually get a job uh, because I've been out of job for a long time and I'm not sure if I can adjust to having a job. And so there are different people with different perspectives, um, but this couple was genuine. They, they used to have, have jobs and they used to have a home, but it was just that uh, they were they been evicted because they couldn't pay the rent. And um, they certainly were looking for jobs and um, they just haven't gotten it in time. And so what I did was, uh, what well, you know, with coins, what can you do? Like, I can't pay for the rent. I can't even feed them properly, right? And so I said, you know what? I don't have anything to give you, but can I pray for you? And uh, the couple were just so welcoming. You know what? We also believe in Christ, and we we would love to be prayed over. And I was like, Phew, okay, at least they're not thinking of me as like a religious hypocrite, you know, hypocrite. Um, but rather they, they welcomed it. And so that I just uh, prayed for them. Um, what I prayed were very simple. I said, Lord, you love these people, your children. And I know that you have a good plan for them, but uh, you know their circumstances. They just lost their home and um, they need a job. And so we believe and trust that you are a good God, which is very true. I wasn't saying this um, to, to make it sound good. I was just saying what I truly believed in, that who truly God is. You know, I reflected who God is. And, and so, Lord, I pray for a home so that they can safely stay there because it was kind of chilly um, uh, around that time in that season. And I said, please give them the jobs. I, we know that you have something in store for them. Lord, open up the doors. It's very soon, like immediately, like right now. Like, I don't know why I was so bold. What if like, I, I, I pray that prayer and nothing happens? They were so disappointed, right? So there's a risk. But um, I just said bold prayers. We need jobs right now. God help, please help. And, uh, and then um, just because I prayed for them and spent just a few minutes with them and I was late for my appointment, but just because I did a little thing, they were so appreciative and, 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 and they, more important thing, like I, I don't need to be appreciated. Like I want to see them regaining encouragement, like regaining hope is I think what I really wanted to see. And after that conversation, I saw uh, a glimpse of hope in their eyes. Uh, I, th I think they were encouraged. And so I said, God bless you. I hope to see you again. If I see you again, please tell me uh, the updates. You know, give me the updates. And they said, we sure will. And then I, I went away. And then, uh, is that a couple of weeks later, um, I went to the same gym and I was on my way to the same place for the same appointment. And I um, actually rode my car and then I was like, you know what, oh, the wife is still on the street, they haven't found anything, maybe I should just uh, uh, not ask them questions yet, and you know, because I don't want to break their hearts, maybe I should go away. But then something made me stop again. So I was driving, I was passing, and then I stopped my car, parked my car, came, and I said, and I, I, 
think at that time, I, I think I had some, some cash, but then I was like, hey, so um, how are you? And she was like, you know what? Um, thank you so much for the prayers because my husband got a job uh, just a week ago and tomorrow I'm going for an interview. I was like, whoa, <laughs> like I wasn't expecting this. Okay. Of course I prayed and I prayed in faith. I knew God could do something. But then um, I guess when the answer comes, sometimes we're just caught off guard. We're like, really? God answers the pr our prayers, seriously. A witness said immediately, it almost happened immediately, and he has a job now. And uh, tomorrow she's going for an interview, so both of them have a chance to, you know, like the, the wife also has a chance to get a job. And because when the, when the first paycheck comes, they said, you know, uh, the lady said, uh, we'll be able to actually, um, you know, start looking for a, an apartment. Uh, when you have like regular paychecks, then you are um, capable of applying for apartments, right? And so um, I was so happy and I'm so thankful to God who is faithful, who faithfully came through. And I said, oh, sister, you know, like, um, I'm not sure if I called her sister. I think I called her name. I said, you know, um, let's say I'm going to utilize a, a fake name, Lori. Uh, Lori, I'm so happy to hear what uh, God is doing in your life. It is amazing. And I'll keep praying for you. I'll keep praying for your, your home. And I uh, gave her the little cash that I had. And then I just uh, went away. And... Uh, I went to the same gym every week, I think at least twice a week, and I did not see the couple anymore. What a happy news, right? And so God faithfully comes through. Um, of course, they knew Jesus. Um, it was helpful that they were going to church and everything. However, um, even the ones who do not know Jesus Christ at all, and maybe some of you don't know Jesus Christ personal, personally, but um, God created all of us, and there's a good reason for us to say um, brothers and sisters because um, we know that um, we have one parent, like we have the same parent, who is, uh, we call him Father, Abba Father, but do you know that he has motherly aspects? He describes himself sometimes, uh, a hen, mother hen, you know, trying to gather her chicks, um, he calls himself El Shaddai, the double-breasted one who feeds the, the infants, right? The provider. Um, so we call him Abba Father, but actually he has both feminine and ma uh, masculine aspects to himself. And that's why he created the first human beings, male and female. And they both were made in his image. And... Um, So James calls the recipients and audience, you know, um, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because he is very well aware of the fact that we have one creator, uh, one father, one parent. In the book of Ephesians, Apostle Paul um, emphasizes, yeah, we have one Lord. Um, where we're, we're united as one body, yes, one faith. Um, and I, I understand that some of us don't have the same faith. And my prayer is that you come to understand who Jesus is. You get to have a personal encounters with him. So I, I do not want to invite people to a religion um, because... Uh, a religion sounds like impersonal. It almost sounds like a group project. Like a, there's like a uh, ulterior motive. Motive. Um, it sounds like formal and religion. Um, and, and, and some of you come from different backgrounds. So the word religious or religiosity or religion has bad connotations in American context. But those of you who have come from a different um, context, you don't feel allergic toward that word, hopefully. 
but then you know sometimes really the word religion um, gives us the wrong ideas but so so I don't want to invite you to a religion but I want you to uh, experience this personal encounters with this great the greatest person that I've ever met in my whole life and will be called Jesus Christ and that's what I'm inviting you to but um, so we're brothers and sisters believe it or not we have different biological parents and we came from different countries different cultures and we speak different languages uh, our food uh, menus are different and uh, the way we dress ourselves or um, our worldviews are very different and um, we are very diverse which is a great thing but you know uh, we have to understand that we belong to the humanity and all humanity came from one father and so we are certainly brothers and sisters and so James calls his audience um, in understanding of the fact that we have one father so let me continue reading it for you consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything yeah consider it pure joy um, joy joy gives us energy joy gives us laughter and smiles joy gives us hope joy gives us um it it even affects our bodies like our health right um there there are some people who actually come into the room and for some reason when they come into the room like our hearts are like lighthearted, like we were maybe talking about something serious or maybe we were talking about uh, our concerns and the worries of life but when this person comes in and that person probably has life problems as well but for some reason like it just lightens up like it it, it lights up our hearts and um, we tend to kind of smile and we're more at ease and we feel more peaceful like what kind of person is this he, he or she brings in the positive energy um, joy joy and um, but then uh, joy has a greater meaning um, well you can invite a comedian you can invite some people who ha who have like funny stories and, and certainly these people like when they're jo joking around we're like oh my goodness like that's hilarious right this person is a genius that he makes uh, jokes out of everything but uh, jokes themselves do not necessarily give us joy it may give us like instantaneous energy like right at that moment we were like ha 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 yeah and that helps us but then uh, the lasting joy what is that lasting joy it may not be like you know like laughing aloud like instantly for five hours it may not be like that but true joy um, exists when there is a lasting hope a hope that is real you know sometimes uh, you know uh, patients patients with like um, chronic diseases or like um, incurable diseases may have false hope well there are opposite cases too that sometimes people just lose hope very quickly but with fatal illnesses might have false hope right and uh, there are those people who actually have some serious life problems and they just hope that time will take care of it and that it will go away right uh, which is not true at all now um, here when um, when James says consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds life problems obstacles you know maybe people giving you a hard time or certain circumstances that are troublesome you know it could be um, 
it, it has to do with their job situations, it could be your financial situations, uh, maybe your relationships are breaking down, uh, maybe you have physical problems, maybe um, you know, we have a very bleak future, um, things like that. I mean, these are like heavily weighing down on us. You know, whenever we think of it, um, we tend to kind of feel the weight, and I understand that. But um, consider it pure joy. I'm laughing because it's so contradictory, right? It's so, um, it sounds like an oxymoron to say consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, so let me explain this to you. Um, James wrote this letter for the believers. Um, you know, in other words, who know Christ in, you know, um, personally, who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, um, although at the beginning I defined all humanity as brothers and sisters, and that is true, in this particular um, writing, James actually um, wrote to the Christian believers. So they have a common understanding. Um, so he wrote particularly to those people who are going through a lot of persecution because uh, um, in early church, um, during the first uh, couple of centuries, especially the first century, there were so many, um, it was just Expect it. If you became a believer, it's, it's just like believing in Christianity in an Islamic culture, uh, in an Islamic country. So, in a family, if you find somebody with a different religion, by, by their laws, Islamic people can actually come and kill you. And your family uh, consider you as uh, a, a source of shame, um, like you turned your back against us. Uh, you're saying no to uh, to belonging to the family, so you, you do not belong to this family anymore. So like you have to either leave, or we we can follow and actually kill you. So um, it's just it was just like that. And during the first century, when Christians, um, you know, if you become a Christian, then you are subject to persecution and trials. And so uh, the early church and early uh, house churches. So when we say early church. There was no single one church that gathered in Jer Jerusalem. No, that's not true. So all the believers, they organically gathered as family groups, you know, like a, a little community, as small groups, uh, as a slightly like mid-sized groups too. Um, and they were always meeting in homes organically. It was not like, oh, today, tonight, we are going to have a Wednesday service and therefore um, like 200 of you all need to come to the sanctuary. That was not the case. Um, no, they probably had public services as well, uh, regular services, yes. But, to, especially to celebrate the Lord's Day. Other times, they just gather uh, for dinner, for for just sharing, um, to to get something, you know, like a, if you're in need. Um, there were uh, people who were living in disadvantaged areas and. Many of the believers actually back then belonged to the uh, lower class um, population. Not all, but you know many of them. And so um, then they would gather and they would break bread together. Um, oh, you know what? I don't have a pot. Like, do you have a pot? <laughs> um, oh, you know, I don't have any clothes for my children. Do you have? Do you have some extra clothes? You know that your children don't wear anymore. Things like that. I mean, they they probably help each other, sharing their positions, and uh, maybe for that reason they gather too. So whatever the, whatever the motivator was, they would gather, and when they gathered, they broke bread, they prayed together, they sang praise songs, and they uh, shared the word of God. So that was an organic house church back then. And so um, there were many, many, many house churches back then. Now. I utilize the word house church, which sounds like a technical term, but uh, for like a better description, you know, uh, vocabulary words, I, I use that word. Um, they just gathered organically wherever they were, and they were so happy to see each other.
There was a time when uh, I was going to a seminary and I belonged to a student organization. I, I, actually, I belonged to a couple of different organizations, more than a couple, but anyway, um, one of the organizations that I was part of, um, we were staff members, you know, to make things happen. We had our um, leaders, the leaders couple, and we had other families. We had single people serving as staff members. And I was a staff member, and so we had staff meetings. And uh, we had lots of spiritual events together. Um, but then, um, I think we uh, loved each other quite a bit. We loved each other to the degree that we started to feel that, you know, one of the one of the father uh, fathers of two children even said, um, you know, like uh, so we were we were going somewhere. I think we were going to a beach, yeah, together because we were more than just staff members. We were friends. We were a family actually. We were a family. Um, the little children we uh, we had single people took care of them, babysit them while their moms and dads were taking care of us and it was just a, a family kind of environment and I think we were going to a beach, you know, uh, we had a, a large van, um, the, the leader of the organization actually had a large van and um, he and his wife actually uh, called us and said, you know, just come out, uh, we're going to spend this like uh, two dates uh, at a beach, it's a nice um, summer, summer place and um, one of the deaconess that we know actually offered that opportunity. It's a rare opportunity so let's go. And so it was just like unplanned uh, trip together. And um, on our way we saw, I think on our way back, we saw uh, like I guess we happened to just cross, uh, uh, go across uh, an uh, affluent area where there were so many mansions you know, great, uh, great looking houses. And um, one of the houses uh, seemed to be two, two story and um, it seemed like it had many rooms and a good front yard, backyard, you know, just a, it's a mansion. Um, and so one of the, uh, one of the couples, um, he actually said, oh, we should buy that home. <laughs> we had no money, but he said somehow, oh, we should, we should uh, totally buy that home, don't you think? and um, we should live together. So what he meant by that was uh, he and his wife and two children, and then our leader, uh, leader and leader's wife and their two children, and then uh, we single staff members, we should take up one room each. Maybe families take up two rooms or something like that. And uh, we should live in the same um, mansion. And um, why? And we were like, serious? <laughs> Are you serious? Um, but um, they were semi-serious because the reason they said that is because we were gathering at least four times a week. Um, not for work. I mean, yes, for work too. So uh, there were times when we had multiple events throughout one week <laughs> and we were missing classes sometimes. Um, but the professors were so understanding. We wanted to really um, bring a spiritual revival on our campus, and so we were really uh, devoted. We were really, really serving. Like we, it was not about ourselves. Yeah, it was. It was about like okay, how, how can we provide a spiritually enriching environment for our campus? Was our that that was our purpose, and so we were like-minded. We were one uh, one-hearted, and so we did not care that we were unpaid staff members. We were not paid. Um, but the leaders couple always invited us for a dinner. You know, I think that was our pay. Right? And uh, the wife was such a hospitable person. And she, although she had like two small children, which probably um, took a toll on her schedule, she always prepared something, e even a simple meal, but lots of love. We could feel her care. And um, yeah, married couples actually prepared dinners for us. And uh, what we did, we did a little bit of planning, which was very short, very little planning because um, actually the leader was not a, a J type, but I would say P type, like he did not really care. Like all of us had to step up 
and kind of, he was a great spiritual leader. He was spirit filled. But all the details and all the coordination and organization, like we had to do it uh, because we knew his tendencies to be so spontaneous and not planning, um, not well coordinated. So, like, we um, actually um, all stepped up to do our parts to make things happen. Um, and it worked out pretty nicely. But um, we would gather and do all, very little planning. And the rest of the time, we were having dinner, um, brief dinner. Um, it was not like extravagant, simple dinner. And then uh, we would clean up together and we would start worshiping God. Uh, nobody had to say, let's worship, or we didn't call it a service. No, it was just very natural because I think all of us were spirit-filled. And we just loved worshiping God. And so, singing praise songs, speaking in tongues, sharing whatever the word that God has revealed to each one of us, we would share, uh, we would pray for each other, we would pray for healing. You know, some of us had some issues and you know, we prayed for each other. And there was like authentic sharing of our lives. Um, our spirituality, our problems, our family, uh, things like that. And so um, praying and praising lasted for like two hours straight without anybody saying, let's begin or let's stop. We, we would have spent like the entire night, every night, um, if one of us at least said like, oh, you know what, it's 12 o'clock, 12 midnight, we have an uh, 8 o'clock class tomorrow, we have to go to bed. <laughs> If we did not say that, there were times when we stayed there for until like 2 a.m. All the kids are sleeping on the floor. <laughs> we're still worshiping God and sharing the word. And so we gather four times a week. Can you believe it? Nobody told us. Nobody said we should. Yeah, it was just very enjoyable. Um, and it was like a true family atmosphere. We, we, we genuinely cared for each other. So, um, I'm just imagining, when you love God, to come to think of it, we had very, very, very different personalities. We had very, very different um, skills and even giftings. And uh, we had different strengths and uh, weaknesses, and our perspectives were very different too. We were very unique, each person. But when you love the Lord, when you're spirit-filled, I think you just start loving each other. Um, I think you start understanding each other. You, I think you start just loving to gather to worship God. I think that's what happens when the Spirit is there. So then um, I'm imagining that back in the first century, every gathering of believers was probably like that and more, more so, like more Spirit-filled than what we have experienced um, a few years ago. So, um, then uh, they're truly brothers and sisters. Um, what made them even more passionate about Christ, ironically, was persecution. So, early church was largely persecuted. Uh, we're talking about imprisonment and being killed, uh, being burnt on a stake. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine what they had to go through. So, uh, once you become a believer, it is anticipated. Like, no one could easily say, like, the lip service of, yes, I believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Yay, I'm saved. People were serious about their business because once they became a believer, that means, that meant that the right next day, starting from next day, your life is at risk. Your life and limbs. And so, um, they couldn't openly worship. They could not, um, they had to hide themselves um, in order to avoid unnecessary persecution, right? And so um, it was a very hard situation what they were going through, what they were facing. And so um, James uh, wanted to tell the, uh, encourage, encourage the believers who were under persecution and who were going through a very difficult time. He himself was not an exception. 
he himself was going through that. And in the midst of that, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything mature and complete so well nobody actually likes trials of life nobody actually invites problems because we want to get out of them if possible we do not wish to deliberately like, go through trials nobody does that because it's hard to bear uh, and we're not talking about little problems we're talking about like some huge problems that seem to not go away right um, in this case like Life is threatened, threatened. and um, but it says we have a reason to be joyful about the persecutions and trials of life because we know Jesus Christ, because um, the Holy Spirit is with us, and while we submit ourselves in each situation, it could be a relationship situation, job situation, it could be a um, financial situation, it could be a health situation, it could be any kind of situation that we face, right? Um, in that situation, it, as we look to um, the Holy Spirit, as we look to Jesus, the Holy Spirit actually guides us, okay, in this situation, I know it's painful, I know it's not pleasant, I know um, this person is uh, hateful um, towards you, I know that that person is jealous towards you, I know that your situation is not very nice. I know you lost your job. I know you lost your home. I understand that. Something happened to your children. You know, um, I understand that. But in that situation, um, you know, remember the promises of God. Uh, our ultimate promise about eternal uh, life in heaven, eternal time with. God the Father, who is completely loving and holy, um, that is your reward. But even on this earth, you will experience miracles. And by the way, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, you will start seeing things differently. For example, if you're persecuted um, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, because you became a believer, you're being persecuted then, all of a sudden, joy will well up in your heart. Oh, I deserve to be persecuted for the sake of the holy name of Jesus Christ? This is such a privilege. Wow, thank you, God. But by the way, if there are moments ever when you don't feel a joy, consider it, consider it a pure joy. <clears throat> Fight for joy. Choose joy. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Because it is a source of joy when the persecution happens. When you follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what you're going to experience is, of course, tons of rewards in heaven. But even on this earth, you're going to be complete and mature, not lacking anything. Meaning, we might lack certain physical needs. Yeah, we might, we might lack something. And we will always imperfect. We'll be in imperfect until we die. But mature and complete, will become whole. We'll, um, we will not be tossed back and forth, we will not be tossed, tossed back and forth just like a little child or like a piece of paper in the air, in the air. But rather, you'll be solid in your faith, firmly standing on the ground, firmly holding on to Jesus Christ. You will not be easily shaken, that's maturity, right? And you will be able to minister to other people who have difficulties in their lives. You'll be able to um, encourage people, support people, help them to have more mature faith. You will feel the joy. You will have the joy. When you fight for joy, you will have the joy. Um, and especially when you listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then um, as you're living your lives, 
Some people may say, oh, you poor thing, you don't have this. Oh, you poor thing, you're going through that. Oh, you poor thing, like you don't have any comfort. But you feel, you will know uh, by the heavenly rewards that you have everything, that you have more than other people because your spiritual eyes will be open. Um, I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, there, there is a um, prophetic poet. She, uh, from birth, she suffered um, the cerebral palsy, palsy meaning um, she could not walk straight. I mean, there are some um, people who have cerebral palsy and still walk around but she was like her condition was pretty severe she's always on a wheelchair and um, um, some people with cerebral palsy can actually say things intel intelligibly but her words sentences are completely in unintelligible and so her mother um, always has to listen carefully and translate for her in a normal language that is intelligible for people. And um, she cannot control her voice, of course, and so she cannot sing. Um, her arms are like this, and so she can't write, but she somehow learned to write with her mouth, okay, putting a, a pen in, in, her, in her mouth, and then she would write like this. And um, her mom would always, but, 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 she started to write poems praising God. One of the poems uh, became, I mean, actually several poems became worship songs, contemporary worship songs, but then um, one of the songs that I remember, she said, I do not have anything that the world gives. I do not have wealth. I do not have health. Obviously she has cerebral palsy, which is not going to go away until she dies, right? Um, I don't have the education. She was not educated. I don't have any of this. But I, I found something greater. There's something richer. Um, something more important. Something that makes you even more privileged than any other people on this earth who have wealth, education, and health. That is Jesus Christ. I found him. I found the treasure of heaven. Um, I experienced more love of him compared to other people who have wealth and health and education. God, al God allowed me a special revelation so that my spiritual eyes were open and I'd be, I'd be able to see the mysteries of heaven. I know the things that many people don't know. God is fair. She confesses, God is fair. Of course she was not married and she probably will not get married. Uh, she's a, a little bit old now. Um, she was able to publish so many books, write so many poems that made into worship songs, and uh, she became a speaker, although she, her speech is unintelligible. Her mother would accompany her to different churches and conferences and speak for her. And I've actually seen her personally and she was in the middle of our songs, she became so um, worshipful. She had no control over her voice. She was lifting her hands, screaming and yelling. And I was so touched because I could feel the presence of the Lord. I, I did not know Jesus back then, honestly. I was going to a church. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have the Holy Spirit. But I could feel the Holy Spirit. Through her screaming, she was worshiping God the most high. And um, her screaming was out of joy, out of love for God, and I could feel it. Nobody explained what she was doing. I could feel it. I started weeping, and all my friends, because I, I, was, I was in junior high, all my friends and you know around me, they were like, are you okay? Like, are you, are you just, crying about her screaming, like, what you, what's going on, right? They thought of me so strange, so weird, but um, 
I could almost feel that like the heaven was open and God was saying with open arms, my daughter, I receive your worship. And um, it's no wonder that she became a great speaker, went around um, different churches. Now, um, she understood that when we face many trials of many kinds, if we're filled by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, when we know Jesus, then uh, we can consider it pure joy because we become complete and mature, not lacking anything. And we'll develop perseverance. We'll stand firm in faith and no life tr troubles or even persecutions or even death will have to shake your faith. That's the greatest gift because you have inherited the kingdom of God. And surely you will enjoy great privilege and complete, complete joy forever and in heaven, in the presence of God. So you know what? Be happy. Be joyful. Rejoice over it. Rejoice. I say that again. Rejoice. Because your reward in heaven is great. I hope it makes sense to you. If it doesn't, I hope I have a, another chance to actually talk about it. Um, chapter 7, Socialization. Page 41. I'll try to be brief. Because uh, this is something that you are probably partially familiar with by your life experiences. Okay, um, socialization. Why is it important? Because we're social beings, right? We're created to be with other people, to interact with other people. And um, one keyword that we need to remember is social cognition. Social cognition. What is that? Social cognition is the aware awareness of one's own and other people's mental states. For example, um, emotions, motives, desires, and feelings. Oh, this is what you are feeling right now. I, I can feel it. Oh, this is what you're thinking about. Okay, this is what you what's on your mind. Oh, you have that uh, motivation. Like your motivation is this. You know. Um, awareness of it, coming to know what that is, right? That, that's social cognition. This is key to socialization because without understanding, without recognizing other people's thoughts and feelings, which can happen uh, in autistic uh, children, if you're autistic, you'll have very much difficulty um, recognizing other people's thoughts and feelings. But you need this in order to socialize with other people. This is primarily how you can engage in conversations and how can how you can actually build relationships, right? Socio-cognitive skills refer to the abilities to understand, describe, and predict people's mental states, allowing children to develop a strong social cognition. So socio-cognitive skills are necessary in order to develop so social cognition. Okay? Um, developing social and cognitive awareness is especially important during infancy. Wow, so uh, recognizing other people's feelings and thoughts is very important in infancy when you're a baby to prepare children to interact properly with the social world prior to uh, school entry and so um, it has direct impact on their relationships and su school success even because a school does not just consist of academics you have to do group projects there are um, things that you then school life consists of academics and social life, right? And so is the uh, job situations too. In um, our workplaces, we need to do both work and also um, interactions with other people. 
Those with poor social cognition are more likely to have difficulty making the transition to school. Yeah, to re react more violently in face of harsh parenting. Yeah, um, and to experience difficulties in school that may be misread as conduct problems. Yeah, they will have problems with teachers and um, they'll have problems with their friends because they can be misunderstood, right? And they can also misread other people. Yeah. So um, basically, they need to have disabilities from birth in order to um, have a successful life. Um, how can we help uh, the children's socialization? Okay, page 42. Um, you can help by providing certain activities uh, within a family. Yeah. So, um, children, uh, when they're infants and little, uh, they are very impulsive. Like, like when they have this urge, they have to do it. <laughs> No one can really stop them, you know. Oh, I want to eat this. Then they could just go and grab and just put it into their mouth, right? Oh, I have this urge to like pee pee. Then they have no control, like it has to happen, right? Um, oh, I want to play with that toy. It's like, I'm going to grab it and do it without asking, without, you know, uh, understanding how other people might feel, feel about it. This is mine, you know? And, uh, uh, when you actually tell them no, then they just flip and start crying, right? Throwing temper tantrums uh, because they uh, do not have too much control. Like they haven't learned to control their impulsivity. But they learn it as they age, they uh, grow older. Um, so how much can you control your impulsive thoughts and behaviors? That's a good predictor for social cognition. So parents should provide an adequate balance of guidance and autonomy when playing with their children. So provide activities of play, but then uh, there should be like a balance between like, okay, you can feel free to do whatever you want to do. For instance, okay, there are certain rules, okay? No throwing of toys. Don't grab the toy out of the hands of other people. Um, you need to ask me if you want to do certain things. So there should be a balance. Like it should not be like over controlling, but at the same time, they have to understand the rules and learn to keep the rules while at the same time, they're allowed to explore the environment and utilize their self will and um, the, uh, their social cognition in order to engage in interactions with other people. Activities that involve, involve talking about people's thoughts and desires and feelings and the reasons why they act the way they should be, um, they should, they do, should be privileged. So, um, they could be reading a book, uh, a story, and then say, oh, you know, what, what do you think that a Tom might feel in this kind of situation? Oh, what do you, uh, what do you think that the squirrel might feel, you know, in this situation? Oh, what do you think it would, uh, it would have helped Tom? Because uh, he, he's crying, like, what, what do you think he might need? Um, asking these questions can really help him. Um, story reading, yes, there you go. Uh, you can also um, watch a video together um, and actually talk about it as well. Story reading, questioning children on various events occurring in stories. So, what happened? Okay. And... Um, and especially, uh, it's beneficial to talk about the stories that involve tricks, secrets, or mistakes. Yeah, this gives you um, tons of things to talk about. Help children to adopt the perspective of others. Yeah, so um, I understand that. It, it, it actually starts with empath empathizing with them. So, oh, um, you have frown you know, like a, you're frowning. Are you angry? Um, oh. You're crying. Are you sad? You know, you, you can you can um, empathize with them, and then they will learn to recognize their own feelings. At the same time, that'll kind of help them recognize other people's feelings as well. Help children to adopt the perspective of others. Yeah, and um, uh, 
Um, it could be a play date. It could be just mom and dad, you know, like, oh, this is how I think. What do you think dad is thinking? You know, you can ask those questions as well. Providing reasons might correct in children's misbehaviors. Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, you should actually put the dish in the sink. Wash your hands with soaps before you start playing with your toys because um, if you don't wash your hands, you have food on your hands, and if you touch the toys, the to toys get dirty and they attract like insects, right? So you, sh you should wash yourself um, and then come back. Um, okay, you should not just grab a toy out of uh, your friend's hands. You should just ask, um, can I, sh can you share that toy with me? Can I have that toy for five minutes? Because the other person wants to play as well. You need to ask, you know, like you explain um, why you need to do certain things. Um, it's better than just keep giving commands and instructions because uh, children actually are better motivated and they develop uh, critical thinking if they're given the reasons behind certain behaviors and certain rules. A sensitive and caring parent, uh, parenting style when playing together, peekaboo, you know, pretend play, uh, picture books, uh, be sensitive and caring. Uh, positive didactic uh, exchanges. Children have the opportunity to improve their social and emotional learning, which in turn sets the stage for positive interactions with peer groups. Yeah, so it starts from home, basically. It starts from home, and then it is, it is extended to other situations like um, play dates or um, schooling. It could be um, like field trips and things like that. Uh, social cognition in infancy. Um, Chris Moore and John, John Car Corbett actually uh, did their research. Um, I'm going to just summarize to you. By two to three months of age, infants are able to participate in simple social interactions with others, whereby they can coordinate their gestures, vocalizations, and facial expressions with others. So, for example, when mom looks at the infant and smiles, hi, baby. And the baby goes, you know, smiles back. That's a social interaction. The baby is responding, and the baby can actually start laughing. <laughs> you know, um, this is like I recognize that you're smiling. I recognize that you're happy, and to see your face happy, um, I am happy too. Like that's the kind of message. I mean, this is more sophisticated than what what uh, an infant can actually think. But this, that's kind of the response. You're laughing, so I'm laughing. There's a social exchange. During the second half of the first year, so like six months to 12 months, right? Infants start to engage in joint and shared activities with objects such as toys. They can participate in simple turn-taking games. They can follow the attention of others as well as direct attention of others. They can acquire emotional orientation. So, um, so for example, I. I think I told you that I've served um, as a caregiver in a uh, daycare center before. I was really young too. But um, one of the girls, she was, at that time she was like 13 months of age, so she's well past, but other kids of younger age could actually do this too. Um, she would give me her pacifier. <laughs> and then um, I was like, oh, Actually, I don't. I totally don't need a pacifier at the age of 18, but I received it because she was giving it to me. And then I was like, "What am I supposed to do?" It? So I gave it back to her, and uh, she smiled instantaneously. Oh, you got it! That this is a game, and she um, she grabbed it and then she put it into her mouth, and then she takes it out and gives it to me. And I was like, "Okay, what is this? I don't know what this is, but I, you know, I, I give it back to you." And then she, and then she smiles again put it back in and turn it on. And so there was like a social exchange, a simple turn-taking game, right? Um, sometimes um, the babies actually start dropping an object to the floor. And then it happened to be that either the parent or an older sibling picks it up and give it back to him or her. Then um, this child just saw the response. Okay, this is what happens when I drop it. They, they pick it up for me. Then they sometimes think of it as a fun game. They start dropping more <laughs> repeatedly, and it can become a, uh, become an annoying 
uh, annoying thing for those people who have to pick it up, but the kid is certainly having a fun um, because it's a game. It's sort of a game. I drop it and then you, drop, uh, you have to pick it up. So they understand simple turn-taking activities. During the second year, um, age two, infants become able to recognize that others may experience psychological states that are different from their own. So like, I'm totally happy. Like, I, I just had my pizza, you know, I just had my hot dog, like, I'm happy. But, oh, oh she's crying. Um, she is not happy about something. Um, I don't know what that is. And then, oh, because she doesn't have the toy that she needs. Oh, somebody just, um, said something mean to her, ugly or something like that. Oh, she's just crying. She's not happy. So they start to recognize that uh, not everyone at the same table or in the same area uh, should have the same emotions. They start recognizing that people have different state of um, emotions. Yeah, peer relationships are very important, especially in your teen years. Um, between 5 to 10% of children experience chronic peer relationship difficulties such as rejection and harassment. Very unfortunate, right? By age four at the latest, most children are able to have best friends and know which peers they like or dislike. Yeah, who's your best friend? Oh, um, Bobby. Who's your best friend? Oh, um, Lizzie. You know, they are able to name them. So peer relationship difficulties um, basically, um, you can teach them basic social skills like this as how you start uh, initiating conversations and when the other person says something, like basically just giving them scripts and also um, reduce aggression, um, increase their verbal capacity so that they can actually communicate verbally rather than with their behaviors and uh, peer conflict and rejection can suppress children's motivation for classroom activities. Children who have friends in the classroom and who are accepted by their peers are generally more motivated to, motivated to participate, of course, right? So uh, basically prevention is more important, like try to interact with their babies at home. And these days it's a challenge because both mom and dad can be working and they might be, um, given to like a, ch a child caregiver and the child caregiver has so many duties and can't pay adequate attention to a, a baby. And first of all, I mean, they're not their own babies. And so there's a difference. And, uh, but try to provide as much socialization experience um, to the children when they're little. And then uh, when you see any male adaptive behaviors, then you need to uh, intervene at an early stage. Like early intervention is always a plus. Children from low socioeconomic backgrounds or ethnic minorities also represent at-risk populations for peer difficulties. Mm. In the preschool years, peer play is a natural and dynamic context for bolstering the acquisition of important social competencies in ch with children. And interventions that are interwoven with the context have emerged as the most effective means for improving peer interactions. Socioeconomics come into play because if you are of low socioeconomics, uh, status, then your parents are likely to be uh, overly stretched for like working two jobs and three jobs to make life happen. And um, they might not be highly educated. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions, but then they tend to be not as educated, then they're not as knowledgeable about like, child rearing and or psychology or uh, abnormal behaviors, right? Then uh, the children do not receive the same kind of quality of um, child rearing. Um, parenting, parenting from their parents. Sibling relationships are very important. So siblings are the first um, peers that, I mean, they're not totally peers, they're not of the same age, but you know, they sort of, like, unless there's a huge age gap, um, two, year, two year differences, three year differences, they could be your, your peers and you learn um, to interact with other people. So kids who have um, siblings tend to be more sociable compared to the kids who have grown up um, alone. But these days, uh, because of the lifestyle and all that, uh, many families, and I'm not representing ethnic minorities, right? Uh, many of the higher socioeconomic uh, families tend to have 
uh, lesser number of children or no children at all. They may have dogs and pets. Um, when a child grows up alone, you might want to consider like giving him or her extra time or opportunities to socialize because um, without siblings, you have to learn it somewhere else. Yeah, so having said that, um, always prevention, always early intervention. Um, provide opportunities because uh, uh, prevention is more effective than intervention. It's always so, right? And so, um, having said that, let's close in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, this opportunity to learn about socialization. Lord, we thank you so much for the siblings. Um, even if we grew up in a not a perfect home, Lord, um, by having siblings, we have learned to socialize. And there are so many of us who grew up in a dysfunctional homes that uh, we did not learn the social skills adequately. And Father God, you continue to teach us and guide us, Lord God, and help us learn from other people. Ask to